What if the horrors of war, carnage, destruction, chaos, and the sheer inhumanity of mass slaughter turn out to be fundamental to who we are as a species? A grim thought indeed, but historian Margaret McMillan puts forward that thesis in her new book. It's called War, How Conflict Shaped Us. She is a professor of history at the University of Toronto and at Oxford, and it's there in the UK where we find her tonight. Professor McMillan, it's so good to see you again, uh, admittedly on the other side of the pond as opposed to over here, which I always prefer. But uh, just tell us off the top, how are you managing through this pandemic? Well, like everyone else, um, I had great plans when lockdown started. I thought I was going to read lots of great books and, and tidy up my drawers and do all that sort of stuff. Um, and I find, you know, I'm managing, but it, it's it's gets wearing after a while. How about you? Well, I hear you. Same kind of thing. It's, uh, you know, we all miss people, right? We miss, I miss not having you here in the studio to do this, something like that, for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's. It, I mean, we get used to it, but it's, it's, it's not the same as seeing someone face to face. No question. I want to start with something that you uh, write in the book. Um, you start the book, actually, this way. You say, we do not take war as seriously as it deserves, which is a funny thing to say, because there's nothing in life more serious than going to war. So what do you mean by that? Well, I think we tend to not to want to look at war because we think it's awful, which it is, and we worry that we might have another one, and perhaps we do. And I think we feel perhaps if you study war, it means you want it to happen. And I don't think that's true at all. I think my own view is that we need to understand war because it's so deeply woven into human society and into human history that it's very much a part of what we are and what we've become and what we might be in the future. And what do you see as the consequence of not taking war as seriously as we should? Well, if we don't understand war, then we won't understand how it starts, how it gets out of control often of those who start it, and how difficult it is to end. And then also what you do once the war is over, how you do the reconciliation and the rebuilding that's needed. And so if we don't understand war, I think we will probably fail to understand peace, because peace isn't just an absence of war. Peace is something that has to be built and has to be maintained. And so I think it's very important for us to understand the, the ferocity, the power, and the danger of war. Many years ago, you told an educational consultant whose job it was to, uh, I guess, to, to brand classes in a more appealing way so that more students would want to take them. You told this person that you wanted to teach a course on war, and the response was kind of intriguing. What, what did this person say? He said, I, I want to teach a course on war and society and how the two intertwine. And, and he said, I think you'd probably get more students wanting to take it if you called it peace studies. And actually, I don't think he was right. I think the students were interested in war, and not because they wanted to fight one, but just because they saw it as so something which often they and their parents had, had experienced directly, because where I was teaching at Rice, and there were a lot of students who'd recently arrived in Canada from countries like Vietnam that had been at war. And so I found that students actually were curious about what causes wars, what, what, what makes wars, how wars are fought. And it's something I think we all need to think a bit about. Did that little piece of advice, I mean, was it emblematic of kind of the bigger issue you're trying to convince people of here, namely to focus on war? Let's take it more seriously. I think so. And I think sometimes in the universities, there's been a sense that war studies are all about battles and weapons and, and tactics and strategy. And I don't think that's what it is at all. I think you know, there is certainly military history. But what I'm thinking of is the history of war which as, is as important to humanity as the history of trade, the history of industrialization, the history of science, uh, the history of, of human movements across the globe. It is one of those forces which, for better or worse, has shaped the world in, in which we live and, and really has had a huge impact on history. Well, that was one of the neat things I found about the book, was that it's not just places and dates and so on and so forth. It really is a, a more physical, philosophical uh, look from 30,000 feet at this phenomenon that has so shaped us. Having said that, I am now going to hit you with a name and a date. Uh, we are going to go back to September 1792, battle in Valmy, France, between the... France, why did I say it that way? France, uh, between the ill-equipped French and the powerful Prussians, and you tell us a revolutionary form of warfare was born on that day. What was it? What it was was the difference between the two types of soldiers who were fighting, and, and the Prussian forces were very much the old style of the 18th century soldiers, uh, highly disciplined. I mean, it often took five or six or even more years to turn them into the sort of disciplined soldiers who would do exactly what they were told. And they fought in a very predictable way. They fought in very neat lines. It was very standardized. And they found themselves up against French revolutionary soldiers because by this point there'd been a revolution in France and there was a new sort of government and a, a new sort of feeling afoot in France. And the French revolutionary soldiers weren't trained, weren't disciplined, 
and didn't behave in predictable ways. They didn't march neatly onto the battlefield. They came streaming on, often singing revolutionary songs, shouting, vive la République, vive la France. And they streamed across the field, apparently not worried about dying in the cause. And, th and this actually stunned the soldiers on the other side and the generals on the other side because they hadn't seen soldiers who fought like this. A lot of them found it horrific. And in the end, it wasn't a great victory, in fact, for the French revolutionary soldiers, but it was important enough that they had held off this highly professional army. And I think something new was being born there. That Goethe, who was a very young poet at that point, was there, and he said something new has come about. And I think what we began to get was people fighting for cause, and it had happened before in history with, with religion, but this time they were fighting for the nation and fighting for the revolution. And it did make them formidable because they didn't understand they weren't meant to take risks. They were, they were prepared to die for a cause, and that made them very difficult to fight. In which case, the emergence of this nationalism, which you point to that place and that time as emerging in some respects for the first time, what do you think it meant for future wars going forward? Well, what it meant, I think, in the 19th century was as you got more and more nationalisms developing, it, it meant that you got a new kind of relationship between the country and, and the individual living in it. Before the French Revolution, people were subjects of the ruler, and that was true pretty much across Europe, although you had some countries like Sweden and, and, and England where people felt more as if they belonged to, they, they owned their own government. But what happened as a result of the French Revolution and the growth of nationalism is, is, nationalism is people felt they were part of something called the nation. It was something bigger than them. It had existed before them. It would exist after them. And, and it was in a way a cause. But they also had a different relationship to their own governments. If you vote for a government, then you, in a sense, own it. But you also have an obligation to it. You need to come to its defense and to the defense of the country if it's at war. And so what we got, I think, in the 19th century was the spread of a very different sort of motivation for going to war and among those who actually were going to fight it. Hmm. Let me pluck a quote out of the book here. And this, uh, we'll take everybody back here to the, basically the turn of the 19th century into the 20th. Uh, V.W. Herbert, you quote him in the book. Uh, this is a, uh, a British military journal. And uh, here's the quote. Is not war the grand scheme of nature by which degenerate, weak, or otherwise harmful states are eliminated from the concerted action of civilized nations and assimilated to those who are strong, vital, and beneficial in their influences? I mean, this is really might makes right at its most basic. How long did this type of thinking go on for? Well, I think it went on for quite a long time, and I find it absolutely horrific this idea that war is somehow a purifying and a, and a cleansing thing. It's very much influenced by the thought of Charles Darwin, although I think he would not have approved of the way in which it was applied to human societies. The idea that there was a struggle for survival and the fittest, those, those who were ready to struggle, those who were most adapted to their environment would survive. And so there was almost a moral thing that if you fail to survive, well, then you were probably weak and degenerate and should disappear anyway. And it was something that helped to fuel the European expansion of the 19th century into places like Africa, a sense that they were somehow a superior race. I think it's, it's appalling, but I think we need to understand it because it was a very powerful motivating force. And it wasn't just confined to a, a few intellectuals in universities. A lot of people felt this. And a lot of people talked in terms of their nation, or as they often called it, their race, as though the English race was superior to the French race and, and therefore de deserved to do better and deserved to conquer and, and survive, or the German race was better than the French race, or the Russian race was better than the German race. I mean, this was, this was the language of the time, and you can see where it would lead, and it did lead to, to often ferocious wars. Well, let, let's continue to fast forward, and we, we don't have to go too far forward to get to World War I, where up until then, I gather some in society were worried that society was looking a bit too soft on the eve of World War I. Can you uh, better help, help us better understand what that meant? Well, it's tied in, I think, with this idea that those that struggle for survival are going to survive, and those that aren't prepared to struggle for their survival deserve to go to the wall and, and in fact, deserve to disappear from the face of the earth or be assimilated by someone else. And there was a worry among a lot of European elites that the younger generation, I suppose this always happens, but the younger generation were getting soft, um, too many people were living in cities, there was a sense that people who lived in cities were weaker and, and were as tough as those who lived in the countryside in the healthy outdoors and so on. And I think there was a fear of degeneration. There was a very popular book, actually, called Degeneration, written in, in, the, in the late 1890s, which went into many editions and, and sort of had very alarmist things about how a group 
a nation or a race, because they often use the terms interchangeably, would get degenerate and, and its people would not be capable of fighting and the women wouldn't have enough children. I mean, this, this is a fear that runs through a lot of the late 19th century. And there were those who said a war would be a good thing. It would be like a tonic. It would perk people up and it would make them less selfish. I mean, I, I find this sort of thinking appalling, but we have to understand that it was actually quite influential at the time. Well, let me follow that up with another conundrum that uh, the following quote from your book raises. And here we go. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring up this quote. Many veterans also look back nostalgically to that comradeship and the ways in which life was simpler, with fewer alternatives or choices. And some miss the excitement. Quote, probably he would never look down on the lines again, wrote a British pilot after the First World War. Never search the sky for Huns. Never fire his guns at a living target. Never hear the infernal staccato behind him. Never see tracers come up from the ground. All that was over and past. Never more the dawn patrol and the hard-boiled egg. Never more the terrific binges and the inimitable comradeship. Never more the frantic excitement and the ghastly fear. All that was over and life was empty. I find that so fascinating because, I mean, World War I was just, it was never ending mud and blood and carnage and, and at the end of the day, so useless. How does someone look back at all of that and miss it? It's one of the great paradoxes of war, and I think it's very difficult for those, for those of us who've never been in a war to understand that there is an exhilaration, or there can be an exhilaration being in war, and there can be a comradeship. I mean, what comes out of, you know, the First World War, we think of the mud and the horror and the trenches, but a lot of those who were there saw it in a different way and wrote about it in a different way. And what they do talk about is the comradeship, that never in ordinary life do you have that sense of being with a group of people who will die for you and you're ready to die for them. And also what, what a lot of people have said about war is you get this intensity of emotion and intensity of the experience. And this is something which is very difficult to discuss but a number of people have tried to write about it. Um, Svetlana Alexievich, the, the Belarusian writer who won the Nobel Prize, interviews people who talk about how everything in combat seems much more intense and the colors are brighter and life seems enormously precious because you know you're about to leave it. And so you do get, I think, among, at least not everyone, but there's certainly among those who fight, who talk about the attraction of war. And that, that's what makes the whole subject so interesting because it is something we rightly regard as horrific and we rightly regard it as a failure when countries go to war but i think we have to remember for those who fight it there can be something about war that is enormously seductive and i think we need to try and understand that not to be too glib here but uh, i hear you but can't you get the same feeling just winning the stanley cup or something like that and it's a lot easier on your health yeah well sport in some ways is, is a substitute for war among nations. I mean, the Olympics was, was set up, the modern Olympics was, was started before the First World War in order to bring the young people of the world together and not to have nationalism. And in fact, what they've become is, is highly competitive nationalistic things. But I think, I suppose, going into combat must be a bit like going off a ski jump, um, racing a very fast motorcycle. I've, I've had soldiers actually say that to me, that they get the same thrill from going very, very fast driving a car or on a motorcycle because they know that they might die. And as one of them said to me once, that gives it an extra edge. I mean, these, these are things that I don't understand because I don't live in that world, but they, these are things that a lot of people have experienced. Let me pursue that notion of, of putting one's life on the line. And uh, I'll come at it from, kind of from the back door here. There are, I mean, we're going through a time right now in many Western nations where our origin stories and our historical figures are increasingly... Uh, you know, coming, coming under historical review. They're now being seen as racists. They're now being seen as colonialists. What do you think that does to a population's willingness to enlist, serve, and potentially die for a country whose, you know, pure white history isn't quite as pure and white as you thought? It's a very good question. And I do think cultural factors are, have been and still are very important in whether people are willing or not to fight for their countries. I think that you certainly, we've certainly seen societies in the past, um, Prussia, for example, in the 17th and 18th and 19th century was a country which valued war and, and honored those who, who were, were good at making war. And young men of the upper classes were brought up to be very brave, not to fear dying, and be prepared to go off and, and fight for their king if, if, if asked. And so I think you know the, the ways in which people conceive of themselves and conceive of their countries can influence their willingness to fight. 
But what I find is interesting is we never quite will know how people will react if a war threatens. In the 1930s, in the United Kingdom, a lot of young people said, we'll never fight. Um, we think the whole ruling establishment is, is, is corrupt, ineffective. We don't want to fight for this country. We don't want to go to war again. And yet when the Nazi, the, Axis, the Nazi and, and its Axis partners, when that menace became clear, those young people did go off and fight, and many of them volunteered. So I don't think we, we ever know entirely how we'll react. And I don't see anything wrong in a country discussing its own history and being aware of its own failings and being aware of the things that it's done wrong in the past. I mean, I think that could actually strengthen a country, that if you are prepared to, to look at your country's history and, and, and try and understand it and try and make things better. I mean, I think if you just give up and say, I live in a hopeless country, well, that, that obviously isn't going to make for a very united country. But if you say, we're doing our best and we're gonna try and mend things, that can actually be a very strong reason to feel an attachment to your country. Hmm. I wonder if we can talk about how the nature of war has changed in the intervening years. Uh, from this standpoint, uh, clearly in World War I and World War II, there was no difficulty among any of the powers in killing as many non-combatant civilians as was possible to do. Uh, that seems to have changed nowadays, certainly among Western powers. When Western powers go to war, they seem to try hard nowadays not to kill as many citizens as possible. Would you say that's fair? I think that's true, but I think they're also trying very hard not to kill as many of their soldiers as possible. I mean, I think the sorts of losses that countries took in the First World War and the Second World War, we would find unimaginable today. I mean, you know, we, we, we mourn every death uh, in somewhere like Afghanistan or the Americans mourn every death in somewhere like Iraq. And, you know, we, we don't have those huge losses that they had in the First and Second World Wars. And I think you're right. I think we're also trying very hard not to kill civilians, but it hasn't prevented us, uh, certainly hasn't prevented certain forces from the West in bombing villages by mistake, perhaps. I mean, you know, the, an awful lot of civilians are still being killed. I mean, it, to our credit, I think, we, we deplore it. But we are still not sparing civilians when it goes to war. We, we you know, that awful expression, collateral damage, um, is about civilians getting killed, um, getting caught in in the crossfire. That collateral damage today, though, I mean, it, 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 people may not know this. I mean, 50 million people died 75 years ago in World War II. 50 million people, maybe 80 million civilians. I mean, the numbers are, uh, no one can be precise about that. I mean, those numbers yeah. would be completely intolerable and unacceptable today in, in presumably any country in the world. What's changed? Well, it's changed in some parts of the world. I think it's changed in the West. I think we're no longer prepared as societies to accept those sort of losses, and we no longer want to think of ourselves as being able to inflict them. But there are still parts of the world where an awful lot of people are dying in war. I mean, you think of the numbers who died in the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s. Maybe 750,000 people died. We don't think enough about that because it's somewhere else and it's another part of the world. And an awful lot of people have died in the long running wars in Africa, in the Middle East. And so I think it depends very much where you are, whether you have to confront the possibility of death in war and, and whether those casualties are acceptable or not. No, that's a very fair point. And, and um, you know, I think about Vimy, where we had 10,000 casualties over a few days in you know, fight, 100, fighting 103 years ago on Vimy Ridge, and we had 150 dead fighting in Afghanistan. Now, I, I don't want to minimize the sacrifice of those 150 and, the, and their families and so on, but, but there's a difference between that and 10,000. And, uh, you know, I, I almost don't even know what the question is here, but clearly we have, we have a greater sensitivity to loss of any kind today that I wonder whether it makes war in some respects, um, you know, is it going to become obsolete at some point because the public is just not going to accept any loss of life at all? I don't know. It's a very interesting question. I mean, I think we have changed significantly in Western societies and we no longer are prepared as societies to contemplate the sort of losses that people were prepared to contemplate 100 or 150 years ago. Those are simply intolerable for us. And I think that is actually a very good thing, but that doesn't mean that we won't get involved in wars in the future. I mean, so often wars happen by accident. Or what we also have, I think, is, is a trend in, in making war now where we tend to rely on the technology. And so we imagine wars being fought increasingly by technology where we won't have to risk the lives of our, 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 our military. So for example, we will use drones, which don't, don't involve human beings being, being present. I mean, they can be directed from a great distance away. We'll use artificial intelligence, or we will use cyber war. 
But there will still be parts of the world in which actual hand-to-hand, fist-to-fist, gun-to-gun combat will take place. And I think we should be careful to assume that we have become so nice and so gentle that we would never do that again. And societies change. And I don't want to be pessimistic, but, you know, I, I look south of the borders of the United States and I find very alarming the presence and the appearance of increasing numbers of militia who dress themselves in what look like military uniform and carry guns. Um, you know, that is not a good sign, it seems to me. It doesn't seem to indicate that we are moving or the United States is moving away from violence as a means of settling disputes. I wonder if we should put these in two different buckets. So on, uh, on the one hand, you know, America clearly did under George W. Bush's um, administration, it invaded Iraq. Um, under Ronald Reagan, they invaded Grenada. I mean, America does invade much smaller countries nowadays. But the notion of big powers going to war against each other, I mean, I well remember your book on how World War I started, and that was, that was a superb book, and, and how so much of it started uh, by accident, by fluke, by, uh, you know, in, in ways that no one wanted to see happen. But the notion of great powers going at it on a battlefield today is that imaginable in your world? Well, I hope not, but we still have in this world enormous military establishments. Now, they are called defense departments largely, but if you have a military establishment, in some way you are thinking about the possibility of war and you have to make the plans. And we do have tensions in the world today. We have tensions between the United States and China. The United States has by far the biggest military in the world, but the Chinese have been spending enormously since about 2002 and building up their armed forces. We've had gunfire on the borders between India and China. And so the idea is that that these great powers will never go to war with each other, I think, I'd like to think is true, but they have the potential and they have the capability of going to war with each other. What always worries me is accidents happen. No, you will get um, you know, an incident which will turn into a dangerous confrontation. And I, I worry about the escalation of rhetoric. I mean, I don't think we're going to have another war, but I think we needn't, we ought not to be complacent about it. I think complacency actually can be dangerous. Uh, the, the, the world might also worry about, about hearing wolf cried one time too many. And again, you're quite right. We don't want to say that it's not going to happen. But I've been doing stories for 10 years and interviews on this program for 10 years with people who say war in the South China Sea among great powers is, is a matter of months away. Now, thank God it hasn't happened yet, but, I mean, how cocky do we want to get about this? Well, I, I take your point, and, and we can be too alarmist, and I, I don't want to be alarmist because I think that it can create its own momentum and, and can, you know, if you start to think a war is inevitable, then you start to act as if it's going to happen, and I think it makes it that much more likely. But I do find the present situation worrying. I mean, there is the the way in which China has been asserting more and more its what it calls its rights in the South China Sea, and the way in which it is now making threats about Taiwan, um, suggesting that it might be contemplating military action against Taiwan. These, I think, are are more evident and and perhaps more dangerous than they were 10 years ago. Uh, Let's finish up on this, Professor McMillan. Given all of your research and uh, a look back at the nature of war over the last many centuries, is peace an aberration among us humans? Well, sometimes I fear so. I mean, you think of how much war there has been in human society. It's hard to think of a century in which there hasn't been war, and it's hard to think of a time when there's not been war in some part of the world or other. And so it is, I think, it has been deeply intertwined in our society, but so has peace. And I think we have developed over the centuries and there's ways perhaps of, of making peace, ways of trying to prevent war. And I think that's as important. I think that's what we need to try and do. And so, you know, I'm not, I'm not a warmonger. I don't want a war. But I do think we, we need to take it seriously and take its prospects seriously because if we do that, then we have more hope of, of having peace, it seems to me. That's Margaret McMillan. She is the author of War, How Conflict Shaped Us. She's a professor of history at the University of Toronto and Oxford where we have reached her tonight. Professor McMillan, it's always great to have you on our program. You take care, and uh, we'll talk to you again when the next book comes out, okay? Thank you. It was a pleasure to talk to you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario, and by viewers like you. Thank you.